Good morning. Today we are going to talk about the properties of the liquid surfaces. Uh, as we know, the most of the liquids which we encounter in nature is uh, uh, not truly bounded from all possible uh, directions. The sea have the open surface, the lakes have the open surface, our atmosphere has an open surface, even a tea or coffee in our cups have the open surface. So the important thing to understand is what's actually is happening on the surface of the liquid. And uh, we shall be uh, starting with a uh, um, short presentation. And this film, which we will see, is a, a, a film shot by the NASA in the uh, International Space Station, which shows how the liquids released from a container behaves in the zero gravity. Cool, just to watch it move. Okay, there. Okay, I'm going to put a pump of air in from this side. Here we go. Wow. Cool. Wow, I just love those oscillations. Here we go. Okay. Let me switch you to a black background. Yeah, so that's about 800 mils. So this should put it around 1100 milliliters. Let's see what happens here. Oh, I just love that. Look at that, amazing. Just one of these jaw-dropping moments. Okay, here we go to do it again, looking into the camera, big pop, here we go. Oh, right at the lens, I saved the lens. Uh, so as you have uh, seen uh, a water in the outer space assumes the form of the sphere. There's a huge sphere which is surely suspended by a wire, otherwise we will float around the uh, cabin of the spaceship. But when it is excited, it shows a peculiar form of a changes of shape of the droplet. And in addition, at a certain stage, we have seen that a piece of that volume of that water uh, is ejected out of the uh, big sphere, but again, it assumes a shape of a smaller sphere, which floats freely in the environment of the, of the spaceship. So I have shown this film to, to convince you that when there is no, um, when there is no uh, other force like a gravity exerted on the fluid, the shape of a fluid is a sphere. And uh, why that is happening? It's happening that from all the geometrical objects with a given volume, uh, this, uh, a shape with the smallest possible uh, surface of that uh, with a given volume is a sphere. So when this is happening, then we uh, uh, can immediately deduct that the surface energy uh, uh, of uh, which is related to the, the, the outer layer of our liquid volume must be larger than the bulk energy of the liquid. And that this excess 
energy is responsible for the fact that the liquid assumes that beautiful spherical shape. So this excess energy per unit area of the surface is called the surface free energy. And since energy is measured in joules, then the unit of a surface energy, which is conventionally denoted by a letter sigma, is uh, measured in joules per meter square. So if I have a volume of a liquid uh, uh, with the total surface energy script S, then the total surface energy is the surface energy uh, sigma times a total uh, surface energy. So the surface free energy little sigma is the extensive quantity, is intensive quantity, and the total surface energy is as it should be an extensive variable. So let's um, have a certain volume of a liquid and let's, uh, which has a surface script S and it has therefore the surface energy S times sigma. And we try to analyze what happens when we enlarge the surface of the volume uh, of the liquid by a little bit. And that means that we extend the surface. So we have to do some work to do so. And the work done by extending the total surface energy is a derivative of a total surface energy with respect to the surface energy. And this is simple calculation that it is equal to sigma plus the surface energy times a derivative of a surface energy sigma with respect to the surface. For physically, even that energy of a elementary volume uh, or elementary area of the surface of the of the liquid is uh, might depends on how big the total surface is but for most of the liquids the surface energy does not depend on a total area and therefore the second part in this derivative vanishes and therefore the work done by enlarging the surface of the volume of the liquid is simply our old sigma. So um, let's, uh, and maybe we can enlarge this. So let's uh, look at this from a slightly different viewpoint. And let's uh, consider that we have a metal frame, uh, which are those black lines around here. And we immerse that frame into the liquid and take it out from the liquid. Uh, as you must have seen it many times in experiments, then there is a thin film of a liquid which will be formed on this uh, wire structure. And uh, uh, if the, uh, if, uh, we look at it if the uh, 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 transversal dimension of a frame is capital L and longitudinal length of the wire, which is completely covered with the liquid is capital D, then obviously the surface of this blue rectangle is L times D. And uh, now we, the, the right side uh, uh, of this wire structure is movable. So the length AB is movable and we can push this uh, wire a little bit. So the, it changes its position from AB to A prime D prime and it moves by a distance X. But if we pull that wire, then we exert, then we enlarge the area of the surface covered by the liquid by a delta S equal 
obviously length L times X, and we do some work against the surface tension. And that work, according to the definition, is the area Lx times sigma. So the, since the work is a force times distance, then it is obvious from comparing these two equations, these two equations, that the Lx sigma is equal to f of x. And that means that the sigma is the force which we have to apply in order to enlarge the area divided by the length L. And then we get another definition of a surface energy sigma. And now it is measured in the Newtons per meter. That is of course in agreement with the previous one because a joules over meter square is exactly Newton by meter. So we, uh, we get the other interpretation of a surface energy. This is the work done when we enlarge acting on the length, which is AB, which is drawn on the, which forms the surface of the liquid. So let's generalize what we have said until to now. Let's imagine we have a volume of liquid uh, which is denoted by a blue rectangle, and we have its surface, which is a, which has a surface energy sigma, and the pressure in the outer world is a, denoted as a P sub two, and we enlarge slightly the surface. That is, we can describe the this change of the shape of the surface by a little displacement, which I denoted as a delta zeta. And the delta zeta is a displacement which is perpendicular to the deformed surface at each point. Uh, I, I'm not a too good artist to draw it correctly, but you have to remember that the delta zeta here is a perpendicular to the point on which it touches the, the form surface. So that is quite easy to check what is the work done in order to deform the surface of the liquid. It is the work done against the difference in the pressure, P1 and P2, and it's proportion to the total area and of course, it's proportion to the delta Z. So the total work done in order to deform the surface of the liquid must be the integral over the whole surface of the liquid, a difference of the pressures times delta Zeta and delta S. And since we have enlarged the surface, then we have to add a term, which is a surface energy times the increase in the area of the, inter, of the, of the surface uh, delta S. So this is the most general expression for the work done in our situation when we enlarge the surface of the liquid a little bit and when we have the difference of the pressures. So let's look at this in a more general situation. The most general situation is when the surface is drawn in the three dimensions. And uh, then uh, on each plane, which is perpendicular to the shape of the surface, which is this curved uh, rectangle, can be characterized, and that is something we learn in differential geometry, by a, introducing a local coordinate system in that tangent plane, which obviously is span, the, this, this tangent plane has, is spanned by base of the 
two vectors, uh, T1 and T2, which we can choose perpendicular to each other. And therefore, at each point on the inter on the surface of the liquid, we have a local coordinate system, which consists of the two vectors in the tangent plane, plus a vector which is perpendicular to the surface at that point, which I denoted as the normal vector n. And the geometry of that curved surface is totally characterized by a two main curvatures radiuses, which on this drawing is denoted by k, but I will use the further notation that k is equal to r. I'm sorry, I had this beautiful picture from somewhere, so I decided to keep it on the expense of changing the notation a little bit in calculations. And uh, as some of those two curvatures, k1 and k2, uh, which is the radius of a curvature of two main circles, we, which we can draw on the on the surface, which are to which the vectors t1 and t2 are tangent. The, uh, its sum divided by two is the mean curvature of the of the uh, of the surface. So uh, let's look at our expression for the work which is done to create such a surface where there is inter, where there is difference of the pressures, P1 and P2. And the differential geometry, which we just discussed, tell us that the excess surface area, delta S, is an integral over the whole uh, interface of a delta zeta times as some inverse sum of the principal radiuses. Uh, this expression can, can obviously be derived from what I just have said you, but that you can find in arbitrary textbook on mathematics, on the differ and particularly differential geometry in the three dimensions. So the equilibrium situation is where the delta w is equal to zero. And if I use these two equations, then I obtain an equilibrium condition, which is in the form of an integral over the whole surface of a delta zeta times a complicated bracket times integrated over whole surface in this equal zero. So that obviously impl imply that this is uh, this condition is satisfied if the expression in the square bracket is equal to zero. And that expression in a square bracket tells us that the difference of the pressure across the surface of the liquid must be at equilibrium proportional to the surface energy and a geometrical coefficient, which is the sum of the inverses of the principal radiuses of the surface. So this is a very general, the most general expression for equilibrium on the surface of the liquid in three dimension. And uh, it is named Laplace condition since it was first at least written in an explicit form by a French mathematician Laplace. So that is our most general expression for a boundary condition on the surface of the, of the liquid, which has the surface energy sigma. So let's uh, try to use it in a slightly more complicated situation than that which was on the spaceship. Namely, let's look up what is happening on the interface between the liquid and the air in the presence of a gravity, because this is the situation which we typically encounter on the surface of the air. So I denoted as a P sub two, a pressure in the air, 
and the P1 is, a, is, the, is the pressure of the liquid. And I shall from now on basically only consider incompressible liquids. And as we remember, the incompressible liquid is a liquid for which divergence of a velocity field is equal to zero. So this orange vector is a gravity. And we have the, if there was no gravity, we had this boundary condition, which is given by the uh, Laplace law. Uh, in the situation we discussed, the pressure in the air is basically constant. And the pressure in the liquid, as we know from our discussion of ideal fluid, is a certain constant minus density of the liquid times the gravity potential of the earth, earth gravity times a Z, where the perpendicular axis, axis from the surface of the, our Earth is denoted by a little Z. So this is the expression of the, for the pressure. So when I apply this to the uh, Laplace way, uh, condition, then I obtain the following equation for the equilibrium condition on the surface of a liquid in the presence of a gravity. And uh, this uh, uh, is uh, interesting for, you can easily see that the, there is a characteristic dimension which appears in our equation. And that characteristic dimension is a square root of a surface energy divided by G and rho. And it, this square root of this ratio has a dimension of a length and it is a capillary length. And the capillary length for an ordinary water on the surface of the, on, on the, uh, on, on the earth, I mean, the, you know that the, the earth gravity G changes depending on where we are on the surface, but roughly speaking is all the time slightly less than 10 uh, uh, meters per second square. So this capital, cap, capillary length for a water is of the order of a point 12 uh, a centimeter. Uh, so that is, this is Z over the else, uh, uh, over LC square. So that is a very, very nice expression. And if we want to analyze it in a general situation, uh, then we had to, we, we can use another slightly more, uh, beautiful expression, namely that if the surface of the, of the liquid is a surface in a two dimension surface in three dimension world, therefore, if I have an equation for that surface that the Z dimension, which is perpendicular is a certain function denoted as a zeta of the two remaining coordinates x and y, then the total surface s is, uh, this is a mistake, there should be an equal sign, not plus. Uh, the total surface s is an integral over x and y of a square root of one plus a, a gradient of a zeta in a perpendicular to the z direction. This is the most general expression for the surface given by that equation. And uh, we can now look at the uh, boundary condition on the surface on the, uh, of the liquid using that particular expression for it will be uh, simple to analyze in solving uh, particular problems. So now let, let's see what 
again, I apologize for the mistake that there should be an equal sign instead of a plus here. Uh, uh, let's look what how that expression uh, uh, changes when we consider only a very small deviation of the surface from a flat surface. If uh, that is the case, then the S is equal, fortunately, now the proper sign appears. And this is the approximate expression for small delta Z. And uh, we can uh, easily calculate the increase of the area with respect to the flat surface. And that is just by using a Taylor expansion from this uh, expression. And the final expression is given here. It is nice expression for uh, it, the expression which sits in the square bracket is just a Laplacian of a equation of a surface zeta in the direction x and y, where, as you remember, z is uh, always perpendicular to the underpart flat surface. So when we have it, then we can compare it with the previous expression for the excess surface of the liquid, which we had from the Laplace condition, where, where those inverse of the principal radius have occurred, and that must be equal to each other. And therefore, we get uh, uh, a fundamental equation for all our calculations, uh, which will follow, namely that instead of this uh, exact expression for the principal radiuses of a curvature, I am allowed to use a much nicer analytic expression, namely a transverse Laplacian of a zeta. And that, ex that is something which we should keep in mind for the rest of our lecture. So let's uh, try to solve some problems. We have a, a, a situation uh, 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 when the, but before we solve, solve, solve the problems, let's try to slightly generalize our discussion for a liquid which is not ideal liquid. And uh, as you remember, uh, our tool to um, incorporate a viscosity in our analysis was a surface, uh, was a stress tensor, which <laughs> it's, it's also denoted by the, by the letter sigma, but it carries the, the, the tensorial indices i and j. So I hope there will be no confusion. So we remember that if there is a, no surface tension, if there is a, just a flat interface between two liquids, so to say, liquid one and two, one denoted as a blue liquid and the other as a green liquid, and N is the normal vector, which tell us about the geometry of that interface, then for no surface tension, a boundary condition on that interface was that the ratio of the stress tensors across the interface times a normal vector was equal to zero. So the work done by each of the stress tensors on that hypothetical interface was the same. So that is our no surface tension boundary condition. And therefore, if we have a surface tension, we have to uh, replace that zero by what follows from the Laplace condition. So we get the same expression with the, with the curvatures. And uh, that is now trivially to generalize for the case of viscous liquids, namely the, 
the stress tensor sigma in the eight phase uh, is just a pressure contribution and something which we had denoted as a sigma prime. And that was the viscous part of the stress tensor. So this is uh, now our the most general expression for the boundary condition on the surface of the two liquids where there is a surface energy sigma on the interface and uh, the, there is the full glory with viscosity of the liquids. As you can easily, if you remember the expression for the sigma prime, that it contains a derivative of, uh, of the velocities and particularly that it contains the coefficients of viscosity, both, surf, both shear and the bulk viscosity, then this is a fairly complicated expression which we had to analyze, which we had to use in our analysis. I am, uh, I am uh, showing you now the, uh, uh, an application of our analysis, which somehow is not avoidable in the discussion of a surface of the liquids. And namely, this is the, the following experimental situation. We had a wire construction containing two circles, two circles of a wire, which are kept at the distance between themselves at the distance z, and it is immersed in, a, in the dilution of a soap and removed from the, from the liquid. So then we get the, uh, the red surface, a film of a soap, uh, which is suspended from our wire construction. Uh, the total area of the soap uh, is given by that expression. The only relevant dynamic, the way it is written in such a simple way is that this situation has a cylindrical symmetry. So it is conveniently to write all the expression in the, in the cylindrical coordinate system. So what is important is how the radial coordinates are is changing with the height uh, between the, or the distance between these two wire circles. And that is a, therefore the expression for the surface two pi comes from the uh, uh, integration in a plane perpendicular to Z. And that is the expression and uh, the results for the shape is, a certain constant C1 times a cosine hyperbolic of a Z, and there is another constant C2. I uh, had formulated this as a problem 12 for you to do at home and to try to use uh, what we were talking about the, uh, on our mathematical refreshments about the variation calculus to derive that expression and um, and in particular, once you derive that expression, it is worthwhile to spend some time to discuss what is the physical meaning of this two integration constants C1 and C2, which have emerged in our uh, solution. So uh, let me now go on and discuss a much more complicated problem, which is the <coughs> continuation <clears throat> of what we have discussed uh, uh, for quite a length uh, of discussing the liquid, uh, the surface gravity waves in the ideal liquid. And that is just the slide which refreshes your memory about coordinates we use and the analysis of what we have been using. We had the liquid which was, uh, uh, and there were surface waves with the length weight. 
and uh, this is uh, how we solve the equation. And the frequency for those waves turned out to be its square was proportional to the G and the wave factor K. So this was what we have solved when th there was no surface tension. And now we shall see what are the modifications to the surface gravity waves which are introduced by the presence of the surface tension. So this is again the same picture, but now this were the boundary condition on the surface zeta when there was no surface tension. And the velocity potential for a liquid, the liquid is incompressible and it has a velocity potential, was just the Laplacian of the phi velocity potential equal to zero. And now we are, we have to use as the boundary condition uh, which we had the Laplace condition. And I am making the assumption that the displacement of the surface zeta is pretty small. Therefore, I can use our just so derived expression for the uh, 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 inverse sum of the principal registers R1 and R2. And that is our, now our boundary condition. So when we put that into the condition of the basically uh, an, uh, an extremum of the functional for the Lagrangian for the in ideal fluid, which we discuss, then we obtain the following equation. And now I can solve that equation by making a certain observation. The one observation is that the, uh, the speed with which the interface move up and down, delta zeta over delta t, is, must be equal to the velocity of fluid. And the velocity of the fluid is a gradient of the velocity potential with respect to Z component. So that means that the disease DZ des zeta over delta T is just that derivative. And if I use it, then I can rewrite my boundary condition in the following form. So the zeta has completely disappeared from the expression. I have only velocity potential and I have as condition of the z equals to zero and the Laplace equation to solve all together. So I proceed exactly as we proceeded for the ideal fluid. We are looking for the solution where the velocity potential has a shape of a certain constant capital H times e to the power kz times a cosine function, which describes the wave uh, running on the surface. And when we plug it into this boundary condition and we do the same algebra as we have done for the previous case, when we obtain the following dispersion relation, the dispersion relation, which you can easily now observe that if there is, if the surface tension is set equal to zero, we regain our expression for the surface gravity waves on an ideal fluid. But when there is a surface tension, then the equation is changed. All over the sudden, it has the, it depends on the third power of the wave vector. But I can nicely rewrite it in the following form. And then it is the dispersion relation for a gravity waves on the surface of the ideal liquids multiply a, by a dimensionless bracket because the, that's all I can write as a la, la, capillary length square times a L wave vector K square. So that is our, uh, uh, that is our expression. And in addition now, I can also solve the same problem 
for the gravity waves on a shallow water. That is when I will not make an, an assumption that the height of the liquid, which was denoted by little h, is infinite. And then the only difference is that instead of the coefficient a times e to the power ks, I have to replace it by the coefficient h, capital H, times a cosine hyperbolic, depending on z. And the cosine omega, the wave propagating on the surface remains the same. And then when we proceed exactly as before, the dispersion relation on the shallow water becomes of that form. Uh, this is expression for the frequency of a gravity surface waves on a, on a infinite depth liquid. And then there is this coefficient tangent kh. And uh, you remember that from lecture in mathematics that the tangent hyperbolic looks essential as a step function because it is most of the time equal to either plus or minus one. And then it changes on the, in the relatively narrow region around c equals zero. So that is this factor describe a shape of the liquid at the equilibrium. And that is our expression for uh, frequency. So when the uh, k times h is less than one, which means that the depth of the liquid is uh, smaller than the wavelength uh, of the waves, then the we regain our expression from the previous mm, analysis. So as you see, the surface tension that which we include the surface energy in or surface tension, these are words which we can use uh, without changing essentially any physics is, uh, is of great importance. Uh, Finally, I am not going to present you any calculation at that point because they are pretty lengthy calculations, but we have seen it that on the movie from the, from the, from the film in the spaceship that if I have a sphere of the liquid with a surface tension, which is shown on this drawing as a blue liquid with a green kind of a skin around it, and that just is meant to indicate the surface energy sigma, the radius of the sphere is uh, capital R and the density of the liquid is rho. Then as you remember from the film at the beginning, when they pinch the sphere, then it vibrates. And it, it vibrates by changing its shape. And they are, were not arbitrary changes, but they look pretty regular. So uh, the way to solve this problem is to use the same equations as we used before. The Laplacian of the velocity potential is equal to zero and the boundary condition. And the only problem is that we have to write them in the spherical coordinates. And you remember that on one of our previous lectures, we have I have written for you how uh, complex the Laplacian looks like in the cylindrical coordinates. And the equations, they look pretty complicated, but they can be solved exactly by the fact that in the course of the history, mathematicians and physicists had invented a certain collection of uh, functions which for historical reasons are called a special function. And they are uh, solutions of the differential equations in the spherical coordinates in a three dimension. And they, out of them, those which are convenient for the problem we are now discussing are called Legendre polynomials and associated Legendre polynomials. And they are denoted by this cryptic term P, M, L, and depend on the cosine of theta, which is the angle. And 
we use the previous equation, Laplacian of five class boundary condition, making assumption that the velocity potential is a function of a distance, the radius of a sphere, and two polar angles, two cylinder polar angles, theta and phi, and time. And that is the form which you plot. And then it turns out that the solutions exist only for a particular values of those coefficients L and M. And L changes as a nature numbers, positive nature numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, ba ba ba. And the M is zero plus minus one plus minus two plus minus three. Because the same numbers occur in the modern physics, in the quantum mechanics, then they, we learned that the fact that L and M cannot be arbitrary number, but they're a constant number is related to certain properties of the uh, quantity, physical quantities related to the momentum and to the angular momentum. L is related to the momentum and the M is to the angular momentum. But if we plug this phi into the set of equations which we just have discussed, then, I'm sorry, then the frequency for the waves on the surface of a liquid globe turns out to be proportional to the sigma and inversely proportional to the radius r cubed. And they depend only on the L. And they depend on the L in a particular fashion. It is L times L minus one, L plus two. Why this expression is a very interesting. First, that it shows that the frequency for L equals zero is equal to zero. And the other that the frequency for L equal to one is also equal to zero. And uh, so what is peculiar for uh, what, 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 what what is peculiar in this frequency is that they vanish for L equal zero and L equal to one. And the detailed analysis show that L equals zero, that means that the oscillation of the liquid drop is symmetrically, is spherically symmetric. It's a pulsation, is the breathing of the spherical drop. And since we have made an assumption that this liquid is incompressible, then the conservation of a mass prohibits such an excitation. And the breathing, geometrical breathing, increasing the radius and shortening the radius is only possible when the density changes and the gene density must be constant. So the fact that this frequency vanishes for L, L equals zero, that physically corresponds to the, is, is, is a consequence of incompressibility. But what, why it is zero for L equal to one? L equal to one, this is the wave which will correspond to the translation of a whole sphere without changing its shape in direction in whatever direction in the space. And uh, that of course is not an excitation because when the sphere moves with the constant velocity in arbitrary direction, then I can always using the Galilean principle choose a frame of reference in which this liquid is stationary. So L equal to one, uh, L equal to one is in fact uh, a number which characterize uh, 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 a momentum of a sphere center of mass. And therefore that is the solution 
the fact that the frequency is zero means that there is physically no difference between liquid when it moves with the constant velocity. So the excitation must start with, we observe the change of the shape with L, two, three, four, five, and so forth. And that is, that is a remarkable result. And um, this, uh, this solution is also uh, a mother of a, another very important physical phenomenon, which is called the Morlus and Sekerka instability, namely in the 60s to uh, uh, metallurgist, theoretical metallurgist, Bill Mullins and Bob Sekerka uh, have uh, asked themselves the question, what happens when I have a liquid metal, which is a liquid. And when inside of that liquid, there is already crystallized spherical metal drop, a solid metal sphere, which is colder than the rest of the liquid. Therefore, this colder nucleus of a solid metal will grow. And how does it grow? Does it change the shape or not? And that problem is slightly more complicated because in addition to the surface tension, it has to include also the fact that if the sphere is solidifying, then there is a latent heat for a phase transformation, latent heat for crystallization, which is released on the interface and it has to be incorporated in the analysis of the, of the motion of the nucleus, but that can be done. And it turns out the expression looks pretty similar to what we just have seen, but the, the only problem is that, that excitations of a surface of freezing drop are unstable. And they are unstable when the, this coefficient L becomes larger than six. And that is a, a fundamental instability in the first order phase transition physics. It also happens for the flat surface and for other forms. And it also is uh, to large extent responsible for something which you usually should be able to observe on your window panes during the Christmas period, namely when you see the uh, snow flowers forming on the, on, the, on the glass surfaces when there is very cold outside. And, um, or when you will see uh, a snowflakes falling and you look at it very closely, then they have a particular shape. And that particular shape is hexagonal and hexagons have something to do with the number six. So the crystallization is related to, is, is related to the Mullins and Sekerka instability. I mentioned it, uh, we were not having time to discuss the application of hydrodynamics to the phase transitions uh, where they, where the hydrodynamics play the fundamental role. But uh, I thought that might be of interest to, 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 to talk about the Mullins and Sekerka instability and the snowflakes. After all, it's a Christmas period. And uh, the, the first mathematical and first theoretical description of, of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the crystallization was written by uh, Johannes Kepler, the same gentleman who invented the Kepler laws. 
and um, he wrote a, in the 16th century a book which was called the, of, about the hexagonal snow and uh, with that the, the theory of crystallization uh, started. But since this all involved the special functions, I would like to include the short uh, mathematical refreshment. Uh, I mentioned Legendre polynomials, and these are the functions which are denoted as a T sub n, which are a solution of the particular differential equation which is written here. And the n is a coefficient on the right, and this is a natural number n is equal one, two, three, and so, zero, one, two, three, and so on. This is the Legendre polynomial. And uh, the other form of this polynomial is that if we take this one over the square root of one minus two x t plus t square and expand it in the power of t, then the Legendre polynomials are the coefficients in that expansion. And the solution of that equation or that those coefficients are a polynomials of the order n. So this coefficient on the right hand side determines the order of the polynomial here. And um, the p0 is equal to one, p1 is equal to x. And uh, the important thing is that those polynomials are orthogonal to each other. Therefore, if we take a continuous function on the segment of a real axis from minus one to one, then the Legendre polynomials are perpendicular to each other. That is the integral of a Pn times Pm is equal zero when n is different from m. And if n is equal to m, then the coefficient is two over two n plus mu. And um, this is, there is a branch of mathematics called the special function, which uses this. And um, one can prove that any continuous function on a distance from, on a segment from minus one to one can be expanded in a series of a Legendre polynomial. So they play a similar role like a Fourier coefficients, but we sum on the, about the positive end. And this is the, these are the drawings of the polynomials. And you see they are having a very peculiar form. So no doubt that any functions you can imagine can be expressed as a linear combination of those uh, polynomials. And the associated Legendre polynomials, this with the upper index M, here L is instead of N, is are derivatives of this uh, Legendre polynomials, and here are the the shape of those polynomials. So, in, when you will start doing your own research in where you will use the hydrodynamics, no doubt you will encounter those functions plus another functions which we have no time to discuss, which are called spherical functions which are very, very fundamental in basically all possible applications of the of problems which have a spherical symmetry. All right, so I will now briefly discuss a phenomenon which is of a great importance and which stems from the existence of a surface tension and it's called the kelvin helmholtz instability. This is a situation, we have two liquids, one and two, and they, they have a interface and there is a surface energy which is stored here on the black line. And the upper liquid moves with the constant velocity u, which is this arrow, red arrow, and n is a normal vector. The z is a vertical component and x is a, along the interface. And um, then we have, in order to solve our problem, we introduce a velocity potential uh, in each of those phase. There is a phase one and phase two. And there is, a, of course, a single T here. 
and in the upper line and the, uh, and the green liquid, this solution must contain a contribution from a constant velocity. The velocity in the blue liquid is a, diff is a derivative of a phi two. And that is of course the same as, a, as we use in the discussion of a surface waves and the velocity in the green liquid is having the same expression plus there is a u times dz over dx term. So the boundary condition now looks like here. It's pretty lengthy, but basically the same. And when we make an assumption that the displacement of the inter of the surface zeta is proportional to the wave propagating on it, then we can solve our equation for the omega and obtain the following a very complicated expression. It has a simple term, which reminds you uh, essentially the surface waves, gravity waves, uh, plus this addition term, and this addition term is pretty lengthy. So you have to ask yourself the question, when this solution for omega is real? And the solutions for the omega are real when the densities of these two liquids, rho one and two two, satisfy the following complicated condition, that this complicated ratio must be larger than the fourth power of the velocity u. So let's look what happens when there is no velocity, when the upper liquid is stationary. So we have two liquids with different density, which sits on top of each other, and there is a surface energy in between them. And this simplifies tremendously, and the, the dispersion relation we obtain is of the following form. And, um, you immediately observe that there is something uh, complicated here, namely that if the densities of a second phase of this blue liquid is less than the density of the green liquid, that is the upper liquid is heavier than the lower, then this expression changes time, uh, sign. So we have a negative number here. And uh, we introduce the number, which actually has even a name, it's called the Atwood number. And it is the absolute value of the density over the sum. So this number is always positive. So when we write now our expression, then this dispersion relation is like a gravity wave, but there is a capillary wave contribution, but this term changes sign because it depends on the sign of Atwood number. And therefore, uh, there is also the average capillary length, which is a sigma over, and therefore, if the wavelength lambda is larger than the average capillary length by a factor which is inverse of the Atwood number, then the situation becomes unstable. So what is the physical meaning of it? It is that if I have a heavier liquid sitting on the top of a lighter liquid, but there is a surface energy, then for the wavelengths which are shorter than a certain critical wavelength, the situation is stable. In spite of the fact that the upper liquid is heavier, it does not fall down. But if the wavelengths are larger, then the instability develops and the upper liquid collapses through the lower. You can do this experiment at home, and I strongly urge you to do this. Take a glass of water and I cover it by a cheesecloth and turn it upside. The cheesecloth has these little threads perpendicular to each other. 
and turn it upside down. It's convenient to do that over a sink or over the bathtub. And after the initial time, the situation becomes stable. A heavy liquid is supported by the, that cheesecloth, which plays the role of a surface energy over a lighter liquid, which is the air. And then you take a finger and punch the glass of water from a side. When you do it very fast, nothing happens because the wavelength which you excite in the surface, in the cheesecloth are very short as compared to the etwood, inverse etwood number. And therefore we have a stable situation. But when you put your finger inside of a cheesecloth and just press it, then you excite a length of a wave which is comparable to the size to the to the to the size of the of the radius of the glass, and then the, the whole water goes down through that cheesecloth. So that is the Kelvin Helmholtz instability, which plays tremendously important role. Uh, when we start talking about the magnetohydrodynamics, you will immediately see that the rule of that surface of that term plays a square of a magnetic field. And in some sense, the Kelvin Helmholtz instability is one of the most important instabilities in the plasma dynamics and uh, makes the life of those who try to make uh, fusion reactors pretty complicated. And I would like to end showing you an experiment with the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. Uh, uh, the film comes from the laboratory at Cambridge uh, University. Uh, this is the film and with it we uh, will, when it finished, we will be over uh, today. Why doesn't that? This experiment to look at the Kelvin Helmholtz instability of a shear layer between two layers of fluid begins with a clear layer of fresh water on top of a denser red dyed layer of salty water in a long horizontal tank. To set up this experiment, the empty tank is tilted and then half filled with fresh water. Very slowly, so as not to mix the fluids, dyed salty water is introduced from the bottom corner of the tilted tank. This has been speeded up in the movie. Still working very slowly, the tank is tilted back towards the horizontal and frequent checks are made that the fluids are not sloshing around. When all is ready, the tank is tilted quickly to an angle of about eight degrees. The dense, salty water flows downhill, while the lighter, fresh water flows uphill, and thus shear is generated between the two layers. Suddenly, the interface between them becomes unstable. Let's watch that again closer up. Remember, the lower dyed layer is flowing to the left, while the clear layer flows to the right. The instability initially forms a distinctive pattern, but quickly generates turbulence and mixing of the fluids. Keep your eyes open and you'll see interesting flows like this all around you. Uh, well, as you see, these are the less quality shape of the film. Uh, okay, the, uh, so this was over for today. And uh, with this uh, application to the surface, we basically finish our discussion of a hydrodynamics 
um, of the fluids and uh, uh, I had to make a decision now with what to continue. Uh, initially, I thought that we will have more time. Therefore, we plan also the elastic uh, and the dynamics of the continuous medium being a rigid object, so, so to say, elasticity, plasticity, and so forth. But since I learned that most of you are actually astrophysicists and not interested in the earth crust, then I decided that uh, if your remaining lectures will be devoted to the magnetohydrodynamics to give you a certain idea how the equation of hydrodynamics are modified in order in, to incorporate the interaction with the electromagnetic field. So we shall be doing this after uh, the holidays, after the new year. So since this is our last meeting in this year and before the holidays, let me wish you all the best and uh, in particular, stay healthy. Uh, there is a hope that next year will be much nicer. The vaccine is coming. And uh, in spite of the fact that one can imagine a lot of complication due to the fact that uh, it requires uh, particular logistic uh, skills and uh, also ability of keeping it in particularly good shape means pretty cold. Uh, but let's hope everything will work out and uh, sooner or later we will all get injected and we will continuously but slowly uh, without unnecessary uh, excitement return to the normal life and then we will see each other on the lectures hopefully uh, face to face which I can tell you is much bigger fun than keep talking to your own desktop all of the time. So have a nice holidays and stay healthy.